work at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography or BIO, you'll often hear it called, and that's just located in Dartmouth uh, near the McKay Bridge. And it's actually Canada's largest oceanographic institute and home to four different federal departments. Um, and there's a lot of people that work there. I, I think we're between six and 700 people that work there. So, so if you ask me if I know someone who works at BIO, uh, sometimes I do, but I don't know everyone there. Uh, and while I have a varied well research program that encompasses a lot of different types of activities, my main area of expertise is actually in marine mammal acoustics. And I'm here to tell you about the story of my passive acoustic monitoring program and the exciting work that we're doing in our waters here off Nova Scotia. Um, but before I get to the research, I have to start off by acknowledging that my research program wouldn't exist without the support and efforts of a multitude of mentors and colleagues and employees and students and postdocs and collaborators and the many, many folks who have helped along the way. So the work that I'm gonna be describing in this presentation, it's not a solo effort uh, and a big thank you goes out to all of the folks who have been involved in this research. And especially a big shout out uh, to the whale research group in DFO Maritimes region, uh, who we lovingly referred to ourselves as team whale. And what started off as a pretty small research program back in 2012, uh, when I was first hired on, the, the research program was me. Um, it has grown considerably since that time and has expanded to a really large whale research program involving multiple research scientists and team leads that are leading a number of different programs and projects. Uh, so my, my program is called the Cetacean Research and Monitoring Program, but we also have uh, a right whale unit that's uh, looking at increasing understanding on North Atlantic right whale distribution movement and habitat and assessing risk from human activities. Uh, we have a right whale shipping noise impact project, some noise measurement and modeling uh, projects, and uh, a very new one, a whale acoustic slocum um, program where, where we're starting to test real-time passive acoustic monitoring uh, from slocum gliders, similar to what's being done at a, at a Dalhousie and um, Kim Davies lab at UMB. Um, and I guess it's really appropriate that I'm giving this talk uh, to Dow Biology because uh, the story of where my whale research program at DFO began, uh, it, it actually all started at Dalhousie. And this is uh, a much younger me living in my glory days on Belena, which is Hal Whitehead's um, lab research vessel. And, uh, you know, I, I actually think I look like the perfect Dow poster child in this picture um, on Belena. And I had some of the most amazing experience that I've had at sea and with whales on this boat. And Hal was such an amazing supervisor and mentor and he played a really big role in shaping my current career. Uh, so I, I actually owe Dalhousie a lot. Um, you see my PhD project, it was focused on studying whales off Nova Scotia in an area known as the Gully. And if, in case you don't know, the Gully is this large submarine canyon located um, offshore of Nova Scotia, about 200 kilometers off of Nova Scotia. And it is known for the abundance and diversity of wildlife that occurs there. Um, everything from deep cold water corals uh, to invertebrates and deep water fish and marine mammals as well. And with more than 15 different cetacean species documented to occur in this large oceanographic feature, the gully is a really well-known whale hotspot um, off of Nova Scotia. And it was first designated of a, as a whale sanctuary back in the late uh, 1990s and later recognized as Canada's second marine protected area or MPA in 2004. So this is a really special spot for whales. And part of the reason for the Gully's MPA status was um, it's important to whales, but specifically to this whale. And this is the Northern Bottlenose Whale. And in fact, the core area of the Gully MPA, zone one, is actually considered part of the critical habitat of Northern Bottlenose Whales. So Northern Bottlenose Whales are large tooth whales of the family Ziphidae. 
uh, or otherwise known as the beaked whales. And they are distributed throughout deep waters of the North Atlantic Ocean, but we have this small population known as the Scotian shelf population that occurs in the deep slope waters off Nova Scotia and Southern Newfoundland, um, especially in the Gully MPA. So this Scotian shelf population, it consists of about 170 or so individuals, and it's considered endangered. And the Gully, Shortland, and Haldeman Canyons of the Eastern Scotian Slope of Nova Scotia are where most sightings have occurred. And these three submarine canyons have been designated as critical habitat for the population, which are shown in this map as the red hatched boxes. And it's thought that the whales reside in these areas due to an abundance of their primary prey, which is gonna squid. Um, however, the most data we have on this population, it comes from field studies conducted by the Whitehead Lab in the summer months, and it targets the areas where the whales are most likely to be found. So very little field work was occurring during non-summer months, uh, and relatively little effort was spent in the areas between canyons. So how northern bottlenose whales were using the eastern Scotian slope throughout the year, and in particular these areas between canyons, was largely unknown. So my PhD was actually focused on increasing our understanding of how northern bottlenose whales use the Scotian slope and the areas adjacent to their uh, already identified critical habitats throughout the year. So traditionally, many whale monitoring programs are visual based and require use of a boat and fair winds and calm seas, which results in good visibility. Um, but this means that the Northwest Atlantic, it's not the best place to study whales during most times of the years, and particularly in late fall and winter and early spring. The high winds and poor sea states make visual-based studies quite difficult uh, a lot of the time. Uh, and they're really just plain unpleasant. Uh, so the picture in the bottom left is actually a picture I took from the Bridge of the Hudson when I was uh, out in the Gully area in, a, in winter. And this is where passive acoustic monitoring comes in. So water is a good conductor of sound and sound will travel faster and further underwater than in air. And this means that cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, they've evolved these sensory systems that are highly adapted to sending and receiving underwater acoustic signals. And they use sound for just about everything they do, uh, social bonding, feeding, mating, rearing young, long range communications. And most species are highly vocal and produce distinctive sounds. And what this all means is that we can actually monitor how a species is using an area by passively listening for their sounds. And this is what passive acoustic monitoring or PAM, as you'll hear me refer to it throughout this talk, um, actually is all about. So northern bottlenose whales, they regularly produce um, clicks, these distinctive uh, clicks in order to forage. So the main objective of my PhD, uh, the main objective of my PhD was to use these, uh, these PAM systems that I have pictured here on the right uh, to detect, detect northern bottlenose whale foraging clicks in and around their critical habitat. Uh, so these systems are self-contained underwater recording systems known as marine auto <laughs> automatic recording units or MARUs, uh, shown here as the yellow hard hats. And I deployed these in and around northern bottlenose whale critical habitats. Um, and you can see where I deployed them on this map as the green stars. And these systems they were designed to sit on the bottom of the ocean and record sounds for weeks to months at a time. So my study was conducted over the period of 2006 to 2009. And I would put these systems out generally for three months at a time from uh, either July to September, which I consider to be my summer period or December to February, which I consider to be my winter period. And for a given deployment period, I would have anywhere from one to five recorders deployed and had at least one summer and one winter data set from each of the six recording sites. So all of this data collection, um, it resulted in what I thought was really incredible during my PhD, 
uh, you know, over a thousand gigabytes of acoustic data and just over 3,100 hours of recordings collected. And that was an incredible amount of acoustic data um, for, you know, a decade ago. So there was, there was so much data. I couldn't actually listen to all the recordings and pick out all the bottlenose whale clicks. Uh, I, I had to actually write a program that Hal helped me with quite a bit uh, to help me analyze these recordings to detect the clicks that match the characteristics of bottlenose whale clicks. And the main outcomes of all of this work uh, basically showed that northern bottlenose whale clicks were detected in both summer and winter months and were also regularly detected at the sites outside of the canyon, suggesting that these whales were year-round residents of the Eastern Scotian Slope and that, that the intercanyon areas were important. Uh, I even had this figure in my PhD, and remember this figure, I'll come back to it in a little bit. Um, and basically I had suggested that critical habitat for bottlenose whales should probably look more like this. So not these uh, three boxes that weren't connected, but should actually be one big box all connected together. Uh, however, um, there remained some, some gaps that my PhD work couldn't cover. Uh, so there were still temporal gaps um, in the, the time periods I was able to cover in a tree during my PhD project. And the limited recording frequency range of the systems I was using, they only actually recorded part of the energy in Northern bottlenose whale clicks. And that meant that I was likely missing some clicks and I wasn't sure how many of their clicks I was actually missing um, during my study. So this brings me to my work at DFO. Uh, so fisheries and oceans, uh, we are responsible for management and protection of whales in our Canadian waters. And information on when and where whales occur throughout the year is needed in order for us to um, better understand threats and how to mitigate uh, those threats. So I was hired on full-time by DFO pretty much immediately after I graduated in 2012 uh, to implement the recommendations from my theses. Uh, so I recommended that we do we get some um, recorders that could go out in deep water and record for longer periods um, and could record at higher frequencies so that we could really get a good handle on the occurrence of bottlenose whale clicks uh, in between the canyons. So DFO actually hired me on, um, gave me some equipment to do this. And at that point, the newer technologies were available that allowed for collecting higher frequency data over longer periods of time in deep water. So I was given the funds to support deployments of these newer systems in the gully and also in between the gully, Shortland and Haltham and Canyons. And my three recording sites um, for my first study uh, that I conducted at BIO are actually the green stars on this map. And for the study, I use autonomous multi-channel acoustic recorders or AMARs. And this is a system that's uh, fabricated locally by a company called JASCO Applied Sciences, uh, who we continue to work with today um, within my team. So these systems, they are a bit more complicated than the Marus that we were deploying from Belena. They're bigger and heavier and they require a wench um, to be deployed. So this is sort of what a, a deployment can look like. Um, let me start this video here. So these systems, um, they have more sophisticated acoustic releases than what I was using on my uh, Maros during my PhDs and they require more flotation. Uh, so this is an example of what a uh, typical mooring setup that we have been using in the, in the gully. And basically you see the, these train wheel anchor weights um, sort of weigh the whole system to the bottom. There's a, a set of dual acoustic releases above those. And basically how those work is uh, you send them an acoustic signal um, at the end of your deployment. And that signal tells uh, these, these releases to release themselves from the bottom anchor weight. Uh, and then once they sort of, they have a little mechanical arm that lets go, uh, and once they let go, there's so much flotation above them that the whole system floats to the surface. So we have flotation to help float the acoustic releases. And then we have this big uh, torpedo shaped float for the gully, um, but we have floats that are in other shapes as well. In the video, you saw a float that was shaped more like an orange ball. 
Um, and the acoustic recorder here is the black cylinder that's sitting in the float. And uh, so you tell the system to release from bottom and everything floats to the top and we can pull out the acoustic recorder and then download the data off them. So these are not real time acoustic systems. They'd sit on the bottom of the ocean. And, and for my gully sites or the shelf edge sites, we're deploying these at around 1500 meters deep. So they're, they're really deep, um, some of these recorders that we put out. And uh, I had to use uh, Canadian Coast Guard boats, which are much bigger and do have these cranes and winches available on them uh, so that we could deploy these systems. Uh, because with the anchor weights and all the flotation and instrumentation, they become quite heavy. So that's sort of what a deployment looks like. And uh, over the period of 2012 to 2014, I was collecting data from those three sites that I showed you. And each deployment lasted about six months. And I was able to set it up so that when I, I would retrieve systems, download the data, and then get them back out there in fairly short intervals. So I had near continuous coverage of those three sites over that two year period. And um, for this study, I was collecting now uh, over 16,000 gigabytes of data and 43,000 hours of effort. Um, so a lot of data compared to what I was used to from my PhD. And um, this meant that it was a lot more data to get through. And I was uh, able to bring on a postdoctorate fellow, Joy Stanistreet, to assist with the analysis for this project. And she was able to set up a more sophisticated tooth whale detector classifier system that we would use. It's an algorithm that runs through the acoustic data and pulls out um, the, the clicks and helps assign them to species. And then we can go in, uh, we actually look at all of the detections for a particular species and manually validate them to make sure that uh, they are indeed that species uh, that is being detected. So these figures summarize the main outcomes of this study. And on the left, you'll see the proportion of days uh, for each month of the deployment, which had northern bottle wells clicks present on them at each site. Uh, and on the right, you'll see the number of hours per day with clicks present. And that's throughout the whole two year deployment period. And the, the gray, shading on these figures, they just represent the, the short periods where I didn't have a system in the water. Um, so these graphs, what they do is they highlight the near continuous presence of northern bottlenose whales uh, in the gully throughout the whole year. And they also show consistent foraging throughout the year at those intercanyon sites. So these results, along with the data from the visual acoustic surveys and photo ID studies conducted by uh, a PhD student of HALS at the time, Laura Fire in the Whitehead Lab, um, these resulted in identification of these intercanyon areas as important foraging habitat and movement corridors for northern bottlenose whales. Uh, and this is currently being considered as the uh, for a potential critical habitat designation for bottlenose whales. So. Um, this was our rec after this study, uh, this was what we recommend it should be put forth as important habitat for bottlenose whales and uh, I was really excited to see this because it kind of agrees with what I suggested in my PhD thesis uh, should actually be bottlenose whale important habitat. So while much of my research program is focused on northern bottlenose whales and other beaked whales, uh, these are but one of the many cetacean species that use our waters. So there are more than 20 different species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises that occur off of eastern Canada. And these include several at-risk species, uh, so endangered and threatened or species of special concern. And there remain many gaps in our understanding of the distribution, seasonal occurrence, and habitats of most of these species of Eastern Canada. And PAM can help address uh, some of these knowledge gaps. Uh, we have thus, uh, we kind of took the same 2012-2014 data set and started looking for the presence of other whale species. And I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of some of the studies we did. So for example, um, we looked at the occurrence of humpback whale song and non-song calls. And, and this was actually analysis that was done by a PhD student that was co-supervised by Hal and I. 
Um, so looking at the available sightings data, which is shown here on the right, um, for humpback whales, uh, and at the time, these are the sightings between 1975 to 2015 uh, that we had in a, a whale sightings database within DFO. You can see that um, most of the humpback whale sightings occur in summer months, and probably not surprisingly, there's very few sightings in winter, which are the black dots, and, and there's not a lot of black dots on this map. Um, however, when you look at acoustic detections of the species on our shelf edge recorders, uh, the acoustic detections, they actually peaked in the winter months in the December and January period, suggesting that at least some humpback whales remain in Canadian waters during the winter. And this was a bit surprising because uh, humpback whales, they're thought to migrate out of our waters and into southern breeding grounds to mate in the winter. Um, so it was interesting that we got our peak uh, humpback whale detections in winter in these offshore sites, um, but it also raised the question of why are humpback whales singing in Canadian waters, um, as singing is thought to be a male specific behavior associated with mating on the southern breeding grounds. So uh, the, this is an interesting question and there's uh, a couple of potential answers to it and we're not sure which one is right. Um, so perhaps some animals are, are remaining in Canadian waters, such as juveniles and practicing their singing, um, or perhaps they're just practicing a little bit and, and are delayed before they go down south. Uh, or perhaps there's a mating ground somewhere offshore that we don't really know about. So another example of a study we did with the 2012 to 2014 data was an analysis of blue whale calls on the data sets. And um, I had a, a student who was uh, based at a Duke University analyze these data sets for the presence of uh, blue whale calls. Uh, so that was Beth Rubin. And uh, also with the help of some other acoustic analysts uh, in the lab and um, Jessica Wingfield in, in their lab as well helped with the study. Uh, but basically we went through that two year data set and we categorized the occurrence of blue whale calls. And there's two different call types we were looking at. We were looking at tonal calls, uh, which are thought to be male songs likely associated with mating. And we were also looking at uh, down sweeping calls. And these calls are are thought to be made by both males and females and are likely associated with uh, social interactions in some way, but probably not uh, as directly linked up to mating. And what uh, this study showed is, is somewhat similar to the humpback whales, the tonal calls that the blue whales were making uh, tended to peak in the winter months, whereas the downsweeping calls that are made by both the males and females, uh, they tended to peak in summer. Uh, however, there is some variability that we notice between years and the occurrence of these two different call types. Now, blue whales are another endangered species uh, that are using our waters, and DFO has a responsibility to assess critical habitat for these endangered species, but no critical habitat has been designated for blue whales to date. Uh, so these uh, blue whale acoustic detections were considered along with some other types of data, such as uh, sightings data, both opportunistic sightings, as well as sightings from uh, survey efforts that have occurred sporadically occurred um, on the Scotian shelf and other areas of Eastern Canada, uh, along with um, blue whale habitat suitability models, as well as models of, um, of blue whale prey, uh, which is krill aggregations. Uh, so together, all these different forms of data were looked at, um, and it resulted in identifying um, important habitat for blue whales off of eastern Canada. Uh, and that's what this map on the left actually shows as the results of that review of blue whale important habitat. And the reason for area number four, which is the large uh, polygon that encompasses the deep waters of the Scotian Shelf, as well as around the Grand Banks off southern Newfoundland, um, a lot of that was driven by the PAM detections in our data set, as, as well as the sightings and some of the modeling results.
So these data sets that are collected um, in that 2012 to 2014 time period, so that first uh, sort of PAM study I did at DFO, it really helped demonstrate the value of an acoustic monitoring program for whales and the types of knowledge that can be gained from these PAM studies. So since then, our PAM efforts uh, within DFO have grown from this sort of one-off study that originally started up to look at important habitat of bottlenose whales. Um, to an entire research program. Uh, and just to, to demonstrate how much our program has grown, um, if you look at our, even our equipment inventory of AMARS and other PAM recorders, uh, we started off with, I started off with three systems in 2012 to the 2014 period. And today I have, uh, we have more than 26 AMARS and other acoustic recorders that our team uses. And what this does is it actually allows us to um, analyze anywhere from 12 to 13 sites annually. Um, so we've set ourselves up where we do deployments and recoveries generally once a year, sometimes twice a year. And when we go to do a deployment, we just switch systems out. So we're now able to have fairly continuous coverage of um, up to about 13 sites in any given year. And if we look at the deployments over time, uh, now that we have more systems, we can do more and more deployments. So we started off with three deployment sites in that 2012 to 2014 period. And this has grown to anywhere from 12 to 13 sites uh, per year in recent years. And then finally, the data is the amazing part. Um, so as technology improves, uh, the, the memory space in the aimers that we're buying and the newer aimers that we're buying is also growing considerably. Uh, so I started off you know, collecting around um, 7,000 gigabytes of data per year uh, back in the 2012 to 2014 period. Uh, but in recent years, we're hitting over 40,000 gigabytes of data per year. And, and this year, actually, with the systems we have out, um, a lot of them have more memory space. And, and we're going to hit uh, probably well over 50,000 gigabytes of data when we get those systems back. So um, but yeah, my, my PhD self would probably be amazed at this graph of how much data uh, we're collecting. Um, on an annual basis. And this map uh, actually shows our bottom mounted recorder PAM efforts since 2012 and the sites where we have been monitoring. So the Gully MPA, uh, the, the recorder in here, the biggest circle, um, it represents our longest standing site and we have been collecting data from there for almost a decade. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, great data set to have thinking about um, long-term monitoring in an area of whale occurrence and also underwater uh, sound and noise. We have been monitoring a number of sites along the shelf edge. Um, and a lot of this is driven by uh, beach whale monitoring priorities and, and trying to figure out uh, when and where beach whale occurs uh, throughout deep waters off Nova Scotia. But we also have a number of on-shelf sites, um, including a site in the Graham and Ann Basin in the Bay of Fundy, as well as a couple of sites in Roseway Basin on Southwest Nova Scotia. And, and this on-shelf monitoring is primarily driven by uh, North Atlantic right whale monitoring priorities. Um, and in the case of St. Anne's Bank, uh, it, it was these deployments were done to help us better understand how whales might be using the St. Anne's Bank. Um, MPA area. Um, all this to say that, uh, so there's, there's a wealth of data that's being collected by our team within DFO, but I will also caveat that we are just one region in DFO and PAM data is also being collected by DFO and other regions who have their own PAM networks. And not to mention all of the acoustic data that's being collected by um, academic groups and universities uh, and industry groups. Uh, a couple of years ago, JASCO actually deployed um, over 20 AMERS throughout the Scotian shelf, as well as in waters off Newfoundland and Labrador uh, to look at whale presence and underwater noise. Um, so there, there are a lot of people collecting acoustic data and there's a wealth of PAM data being collected off of Eastern Canada. So it's, it's really impressive how much um, this uh, form of, of data collection and uh, this method of studying cetaceans has grown uh, 
over the last decade. But what have we been doing and what have we been learning from all this data collection? So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of, of some of the things we've been doing within my team uh, with these data sets uh, since, uh, since 2014. So um, one of the things we're looking at is occurrence of different whale species, but over long time scales. So in this example, we're looking at the occurrence of some of the baleen whales that use the gully area um, over the 2015 to 2018 period. And it's, it's kind of interesting to look at the uh, daily presence. So this plot on the left, it shows the proportion of days per month that vocalizations of a given species were present. And you can start to sort of compare the presence of different species to one another over time and look at uh, the different trends and when we hear them. Um, in this case, uh, I, I'm always impressed at with the baleen whales, how we're hearing them um, in many locations that we're monitoring throughout the year. And although the, the occurrence of these species, there does seem to be some seasonality, um, the fact that we're still picking them up, like even in winter months, when we think most of these species are migrating south, uh, is really interesting. Uh, we can also look at occurrence of a given species or multiple species over really broad spatial scales and start comparing what we're hearing at the different sites to one another. Uh, so in this example, we're looking at blue whale daily presence uh, by month, and it's looking at data that was collected over that three-year period, uh, roughly from 2015 to 2018 at these various sites. And you can start to see, you know, which months do we hear the species in um, and at which sites do we get the most detections. And you can start to see patterns for the different species when you, you start to visualize the data more like this. So uh, another example uh, of how we're using this data. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at multi-species beak dwell presence. Um, on the first graph on the left, it's looking at the proportion of days per month with, e with each species present um, in the gully from the period of 2015 to 2019. And what's really interesting about this is that uh, there's, from Hal's work, uh, we know that Northern bottlenose whales um, are resident in the gully year round. And that certainly jumps out on, uh, on this figure where you see they occur on 100% of days. So they're almost, they're, they're there constantly. Um, but we also know Sowerby's beak whale, another rare beak whale species is consistently sighted in the gully. And you can see we also get those consistent acoustic detections. In the case of Cuvier's beak bill, there's only been a, a handful of Cuvier's beak bill sightings um, in the entire Scotian Shelf region, and, and only a couple of sightings from the Whitehead lab work in the gully specifically. However, um, you'll see that we actually acoustically detect them a, a large proportion of the time. Uh, so Cuvier's beak bill, even though we, we don't have a lot of visual sightings and we thought they were very rare in Canadian waters, um, we do hear them quite consistently on a number of our recording sites. And the case of Trues Dervases beak well, um, th these are actually two, Trues and Dervases beak well are two separate species. However, uh, we don't know enough about their clicks. They haven't been uh, well uh, described well enough for us to actually differentiate them. Uh, so the, the clicks made by these two species, they're very similar to one another, and we're not yet confident in telling them apart. So we tend to categorize this fourth beak dwell click um, type as uh, either trues or gervases. Uh, we have a little bit more work to do before we can figure out um, exactly which species it is. And we got our, our first detection of this species in the gully in our 2019 data set. And, um, you can see in the graphs on the, in the figures on the right, uh, the proportion of days from that, um, from that same time period where uh, different, where the proportion of days that these different species were heard at these different sites. Um, I will say there's one caveat with the figure on the left. Uh, so for Cuvier's beak bells and the Trues Dervases beak bell click, uh, they do occur in similar frequency range as the bottlenose whale clicks. 
And because bottlenose whale clicks are so uh, predominant on the gully recording, it means that uh, it's possible that these um, representation of the Cuvier's and Trues Gervais's beaked whale are underestimating the presence of those two species. Uh, because of bottlenose whale clicks can make it really difficult to detect the clicks of these other species. Um, so some really interesting work going on with the beaked whales and especially, you know, the, this new information about Cuvier's and Trues and Gervais's beaked whale and how commonly we're hearing them on some of our recorders. We can also use our acoustic data sets to help us understand behavior. Um, so in this example, this is a part of the work done by Katie Kowalski, the PhD student Hal and I jointly supervised, um, where she was looking at better characterizing uh, the singing behavior of humpbacks off of Nova Scotia, and in particular, the transition into singing from humpback whales. So what the figure uh, the, the graph on the left shows is the different types of sounds that humpback whales are making from non-song non um, vocalizations like cries and cry sequences and grunt sequences um, into actually full-on songs which are shown in the dark blue. And what you can see is that in the, in the fall recording, um, there is this gradual transition where they, they start making songs and it takes several weeks before um, all of the sounds you're recording are actually songs. And in spring, uh, the transition from singing behavior into non-singing behavior is, uh, seems to be a little bit more abrupt. And you can kind of see um, at the end of May, we have still have quite a bit of singing. And then suddenly in, in June, most of most of the calls we're recording are not songs. Um, they're just uh, non-pattern calls and, and grunt sequences. We can also use these um, long-term data sets to help us better understand threats to cetaceans. So underwater noise is a threat that we're really concerned about and is um, considered a threat for a, any cetacean species using our water. And underwater noise can be generated um, by many different activities. Basically just about anything us humans do in the ocean generates underwater noise. Um, so there might be noise impacts happening um, because of shipping or uh, because of uh, seismic and oil and gas activities. Or in, in this case, we were looking at uh, the potential impacts of military sonar on the vocalization behavior of tooth whales. So what you see in this figure, um, this is a study that was being led by Joy um, in her work with me. Uh, she looked at the occurrence of different beaked whale species and sperm whales. So she was looking at sperm whales, cuvier's beaked whales, um, the CBW, and an unidentified mesoplodent beaked whale click. And was looking at the clicking behavior um, both before, during, and after a military sonar, a, a large scale military sonar exercise that occurred off of Nova Scotia. And what these results show is that uh, when the sonar occurred, so the sonar is represented by the red bars in the bottom graph, uh, you can see that um, the clicks of sperm whales and those beaked whales um, basically stop um, for that period. And uh, that is quite different than what you see in the control year, the year before when there was no military exercise. So this suggests that um, there are some changes in beaked and sperm whale vocal behavior that are associated with those military sonar activities. So these are just some of the examples of the work that has been done within our team. Um, and we continue to collect and analyze PAM data. And some of the examples of the studies that we currently have underway include, um, well, we've continue, we're continuing to collect data and assess the occurrence of beaked whales in deep water areas off of Nova Scotia. Um, we're looking at incorporating beaked whale acoustic detections from these data sets into species distribution and habitat suitability models. Uh, we're going to use the acoustic data as well as other data to help assess um, 
the habitat of Scotia and Shelf Northern Bottlenose Whales, but throughout the entire population range. Um, so expanding beyond just the Eastern Scotian Shelf and, and looking at uh, if we can identify any more important habitat more broadly for bottlenose whale. We're continuing to look at the occurrence of blue fin, say humpback and right whale calls and all the data sets we're looking at. Um, I actually have a master's student, Gabrielle Macklin, um, who are, who's being co-supervised by myself and Marty Leonard. And she's looking specifically at say whale call characteristics and the occurrence of say whale calls off of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, some, uh, uh, Angela's been testing directional sensors and other PAM technologies for detecting right whales and, and seeing if they can help us better detect right whales. And um, I have another uh, scientist, Jin Sha, who's been doing some noise modeling for right whale critical habitats in the broader Scotian shelf um, in our team. So these are just some examples of the ongoing work um, that we have. And in addition to this, we're we're also looking at um, new analysis methods to try to help us be more efficient in our analysis because we're collecting more and more acoustic data um, and there's just so much more we could be doing with it if we only had the time. And we also have new data collection tools and new PAM systems and technologies uh, that we've started using. So in addition to our standard sort of one hydrophone PAM systems, we've started to use these multi-channel acoustic recorders equipped with either two or four hydrophones. And uh, with multiple hydrophones, you can start to directionalize. Um, and you know, if you have enough hydrophones, even maybe count uh, the number of animals that you're hearing. We have a vertical line array um, with many hydrophones that are being used to help measure uh, ship noise, but can also be used to directionalize and locate whales and estimate source levels of their calls and help us out with some detection range modeling. Uh, we have PAM recorders with particle motion sensors on them. Uh, we have PAM, re a PAM recorder with a multi-channel active acoustic system on them so that we can start to look at uh, whales that we're acoustically detecting and then also uh, the prey layers in the same area. We have archival PAM packages that we put on our um, ELSIMER gliders that we have at BFO. And also the new program we have is uh, we're purchasing real-time PAM systems and SOCOM gliders uh, to start up a real-time PAM monitoring program. And all of this new instrumentation, uh, this means that there's probably a lot of new research questions that we could be focused on. And while we are progressing on these various high priority PAM studies within Team Well, I also recognize that there's so much more that we could be doing with our data. And I'm really excited with where our program is going. And I see a lot of opportunity for sharing and collaboration and working together to make the most use of our PAM program and the data that we've been collecting. So with that, um, thank you very much for your attention and for joining me on this talk. Again, this, uh, all of this work that I've been presenting, it couldn't have been done without uh, the help of many others. So big thank you to all those who are involved in our research program and in our data collection and analysis. So thank you very much.